In the years after the inauguration of the Women's Memorial in 1913 in Bloemfontein, the need arose to conserve historical objects related to the Anglo-Boer War for future generations. This led to the establishment of the War Museum of the Boer Republics in 1931. The initial building included only two showrooms. As the collections grew, the infrastructure also expanded. Over time, this institution developed into one of the most prestigious and progressive museums in South Africa. This museum fruits nearly 48,000 objects in its collections, tells the story of the South African or Anglo-Boer War. To visit this museum is not a pleasant experience, nor was it meant to be. But through opening the wounds, healing can come. And through that, the political landscape of today can be understood in its full context. The War Museum follows an inclusive approach in which the suffering of all South Africans in the war is depicted. The museum provides in this video a concise overview of its collections that consist of historical objects, archive material, works of art, photographs and other cultural historical items that have been collected over decades. Obviously, the museum offers visitors much more than what can be depicted in this video. Only some aspects of the museum's culture historical heritage will be highlighted within the context of a chronological account of the Anglo-Boer War. The Republic of the Orange Free State was founded in 1854, with Bloemfontein as its capital. Here, Martinus Tiernus Steyn practiced as an advocate. He was married to Rachel Isabella Fraser, a dignified lady and the daughter of a Scottish reverend. Steyn was elected as president of the Orange Free State Republic in 1896. The South African Republic, also known as the Zuid Afrikaanse Republiek or ZAR, was established in 1852 with Pretoria as capital. During the First War of Independence in 1880, Paul Kruger distinguished himself as a courageous combatant and respected leader. After the passing away of his first wife, he married Gesina Duplessis, a gentle and deeply religious woman. Since 1882, Kruger was elected on four consecutive occasions as president of the ZAR. The discovery of gold in the Transvaal and the emergence of the so-called outlander issue kindled the potential for conflict between British imperialism and Afrikaner nationalism. Most of the outlanders or so-called outsiders flocking to the goldfields were British subjects who demanded voting rights after a short period of residency in the Transvaal. The government of the ZAR regarded this demand from the growing number of outlanders as a threat to the independence of the Republic. The British government used this issue as a justification for confrontation with the Kruger government. This led to a diplomatic crisis that President Steyn from the Free State tried to defuse by presenting the Bloemfontein Conference towards the middle of 1899. Around this table, in the former Railway Bureau in Bloemfontein, British imperialism and Afrikaner nationalism set eyes upon each other. Abram Fisher from the Free State, who acted as chairperson, sat here. President Kruger took up position to his left. Sir Alfred Milner, British High Commissioner in South Africa, sat on Fisher's right-hand side. The failed negotiations around this table resulted in a war that would change the history and future of South Africa irrevocably. On 9 October 1899, the ZAR set the British government an ultimatum to withdraw its growing number of troops from the borders of the two Boer republics. After the British government rejected the ultimatum, the war became a reality on 11 October 1899. The Free State, that had already concluded a defence treaty with the ZAR in 1896, honoured its commitment and was now also drawn into the hostilities. 
In accordance with their respective commando conscription legislation, the Free State and Transvaal called up all civilian men, known as burghers, between the ages of 16 and 60 to serve in the commandos. The statue Afskate, meaning parting, is a riveting portrayal of an armed burger on his way to join a commando, greeting his wife and child. Almost 90% of the about 55,000 commando conscripts were ordinary citizens without any formal military training. Britain and its colonies, on the contrary, mustered a professional and well-equipped armed force that numbered more than 450,000 men by the end of the war. By now, the first troop reinforcements had already been on their way to South Africa, where the mobilized Boer commandos were awaiting their arrival. The life of the burghers on commando is depicted in the Louis Buerta Hall in the museum. Exhibits in the Lord Roberts Hall of the Museum focus on British soldiers during the war. The first shots in the war rang out on 12 October 1899 when General Coeur de la Rey ambushed an armoured train at Kraipan. This drinking cup was made from the casing of the first projectile fired at Kraipan. Transport by rail played an important role in the British war effort and was used to carry troops, supplies and weaponry. This Class 7 steam locomotive that served during the war was built in 1893 for the Cape Government Railways by Nielsen and Company in Glasgow, Scotland. The locomotive and carts were donated to the War Museum by the former South African Railways. In 2015, the War Museum acquired a water tank that had been constructed by British soldiers during the war to supply steam locomotives with water at the railway station in Dordrecht. At the beginning of the war, Maffe King, Ladysmith and Kimberley were besieged by Boer forces. In December 1899, the British army suffered three devastating defeats at Stormberg, Marchesfontein and Colenso. These and other battles are depicted in five enormous paintings in the museum. They were initially painted for the military academy in München, Germany. Apart from one or two exceptions, the historical detail in these paintings is astonishingly accurate. The content portrayed in these paintings was most probably based on photographs of the time. After hanging for many years in a shoe factory in Ludwigsburg, Germany, the paintings were purchased and brought to South Africa. The initial success of the Boer forces on the battlefield can in part be attributed to the fact that their marksmanship was highly developed as a result of their pioneering lifestyle in rural areas. Many were familiar with firearms from an early age. The two republics imported modern rifles, especially from Germany. The firearm collection of the museum includes many original examples of the Boer forces Mausers and Martini Henrys, as well as the British Army's Lee Metfords and Lee Enfields. Later in the war, the Boer forces increasingly made use of rifles and ammunition seized from the British Army. Therefore, many burghers started the war with the Mauser, but in the end laid down a Lee Enfield. With the arrival of Lord Frederick Roberts as Commander-in-Chief of the British forces in South Africa, their conventional frontal attacks were replaced with encircling manoeuvres. This tactic was especially successful when General Piet Cronier with his lager of wagons were surrounded at Paderberg. Cronier eventually surrendered with 4,000 men on 27 February 1900, a harrowing setback for the Boer forces.
the British Army could now begin its march to Bloemfontein and Pretoria in all earnest. After the Battle of Paardeberg, the British Army advanced on the Free State capital. Bloemfontein was captured on 13 March 1900. Although not a single shot was fired during the capture, more British soldiers would eventually perish in this city compared to any battle during the war. The cause of these deaths? Water. En route to Bloemfontein, British soldiers unknowingly took contaminated water from the Modder River along in water carts. An example of such a water cart can be observed on the grounds of the War Museum. A deadly enteric fever epidemic broke out amongst the soldiers in Bloemfontein. Medical facilities in the city were limited and eventually about 1,600 men lost their lives. When the museum became aware of a British garrison hospital dating from the war that was on the verge of being demolished, negotiations to conserve the structure were initiated. The building was carefully dismantled and re-erected on the grounds of the museum. In the garrison hospital, visitors can now acquaint themselves with medical aspects of the war. The hospital exhibits, for example, an operating table that belonged to Dr. Valentine Wertmüller from the Batuli Commando. On this table, he fought for the lives of the wounded on many occasions. After the fall of Bloemfontein, President Steyn and the Free State Government evacuated to Kronstadt, Heilbronn and Bethlehem respectively. In spite of a paralyzing disease that he had contracted on commando, presumably due to food poisoning, Steyn was a notable example of perseverance and always in the front lines. On one occasion, General Christian de Wett had to threaten him with a whip during a battle because Steyn refused to remain in his designated hiding place and exposed himself to enemy fire. Steyn is regarded by many as the soul of the Africana struggle for freedom. With the occupation of Pretoria in June 1900, the British commanders were under the impression that the war would soon end. This, however, was only the conclusion of the conventional phase of the war, whereafter the Boer forces changed their tactics to guerrilla warfare. Boer commandos divided into smaller and more mobile mounted units, performing surprise attacks on the British army, seizing supplies and sabotaging railway tracks and telegraph lines. The ingenious manner in which Boer forces derailed trains can be viewed in the museum. General de Wett became world-renowned as a master of guerrilla tactics and a thorn in the flesh of the British Army. An unfinished painting of de Wett in the museum also reveals his personality. He was a person not capable of standing still. In film reels that had been screened all over Europe at the time, the British Army was often mocked for being unable to apprehend De Wett. At the inception of the guerrilla phase and in an attempt to restrict the movement of the smaller Boer combat units, the British Army constructed so-called rice blockhouses on a large scale. To build this type of blockhouse was quick, easy and inexpensive. The War Museum acquired and reconstructed an original example of such a rice blockhouse that had initially been erected near Naval Hill in Bloemfontein. Four months after the occupation of Pretoria, the elderly President Kruger, on instruction of his War Council, departed from Lorenzo Marx for Europe on a warship dispatched by Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands. The aim of this self-imposed exile was to prevent him from being captured by the British Army and to lobby support for their fight against British imperialism. Although the public at large was sympathetic towards Kruger and the Boer Republics, no European country wanted to become involved in the war. Due to ill health, the president's wife, Gesina, remained in the Transvaal. At a later stage, Kruger met with his children and grandchildren in Europe, 
but he and Hasina would never lay eyes on each other again. Meanwhile, the military conflict continued in the Free State and Transvaal. Quite a number of volunteers from countries such as the USA, Italy, Russia, France and the Netherlands assisted the Boer forces in their struggle. Some of these volunteers made valuable contributions to the war effort. For example, volunteers from Russia, the Netherlands and Belgium operated a field ambulance and supplied much-needed medical services to the wounded and injured. Furthermore, Captain Henry Slechtkamp of Dutch descent played a leading role in sabotaging railway lines and derailing trains. Many black farm labourers, known as Achterreyers, literally meaning those who follow in the rear, accompanied their employers on commando. They mostly fulfilled a supportive role by driving wagons, caring for the horses and preparing food. Nonetheless, in some cases, Achterreyers were also armed and participated in military action. One such Achterreyer, known as Reiter, meaning horseman, is specifically remembered for preventing a British officer from apprehending a fleeing burger in the town of Reitz. Reiter referred to the fugitive as a useless old boer not worth catching. The officer then allowed the old boer to get away, not knowing that it actually was President Stain. This scarf formed part of Stain's outfit during his escape. The museum erected a statue in 2013 to commemorate the contribution of Achterreyers during the war. The British Army not only employed black men as labourers and wagon drivers, but also used them actively in the war effort. Some operated as scouts and spies, while others were armed and took part in the fight against the Boer forces. They were promised political rights after the war, but this undertaking did not materialize. A number of Indians served in the medical corps of the British Army. One of these volunteers would later become a world-renowned political pacifist, Mahatma Gandhi. Lord Roberts became increasingly frustrated by the success of the guerrilla tactics of the Boer forces. In order to deny burghers access to food, medical care and information on troop movements, he instructed that so-called scorched earth tactics be implemented. Roberts' successor, Lord Horatio Kitchener, relentlessly maintained the application of these scorched earth tactics. This led to the forced relocation of Boer families and the destruction of about 30,000 farms. In the process, farmsteads were burnt down, while livestock, crops, farm equipment and household possessions were also destroyed. The devastation and suffering caused by these tactics are almost indescribable. The families of members of the Boer forces were relocated from farms to 49 concentration or internment camps. 
280,000 civilians were confounded in such camps. In doing so, the British Army created an unforeseen logistical nightmare for itself and unintentionally subjected the civilian population to a humanitarian disaster. Insufficient food supplies resulting in a meagre diet, a lack of clean potable water, inadequate sanitation facilities, unsatisfactory accommodation and extreme weather conditions caused disease in the camps. This led to the death of more than 27,000 women, children and the elderly. Undisputedly, one of the most tragic consequences of the war. As a result of its prevailing high death rate, especially the camp at Betuli was described by General De Wett as a camp from hell. In 2010, the War Museum erected a concentration camp monument that contains material and objects from this camp. A scale model of a typical concentration camp depicting the living conditions of internees can be viewed in the museum. The portrayal of the fate of especially children in the Children's Museum on the grounds remains captivating. Conditions in the camps only improved after Emily Hobhouse, a British philanthropist, visited South Africa and brought the situation to the attention of the world media. Resultantly, Lloyd George, the leader of the official opposition in the British Parliament, condemned the conditions in the camps as barbaric. Thereafter, the British government was pressurised to improve the conditions in the camps with a resultant decline in the ensuing death rate. Water paintings by Hobhouse dating from 1903 and her travelling chest can be seen in the museum. Here is a necklace with platinum and diamonds from the Jagersfontein mine, which was presented to her as a token of appreciation by the Free State Boer community. A sculpture of Hobhouse, which did not meet her approval because it allegedly portrayed her as old and sickly, can also be viewed. Hobhouse's exposure of the camp system and high death toll, as well as her assistance and sympathy with the Boer women and children during the war, ultimately made her an outcast in her own country. The houses and livestock of black small-scale farmers in the Free State were also destroyed during the application of scorched earth tactics. The black rural population was transferred to 65 concentration camps, where at least 24,000 lost their lives due to disease and poor living conditions. In 2010, the War Museum unveiled a memorial to commemorate the suffering of both white and black women and children during the war. The museum erected the Sol Pleike Hall in 2015 to specifically highlight the role of black South Africans in the war. Video productions depicting their fate can be viewed here. 
a tombstone from a black camp is also on display. The entrancing photo collection in this hall confirms that the Anglo-Boer War had not been a white man's war only. To prevent escape, about 23,000 Boer prisoners of war were shipped to overseas camps in, amongst others, St. Helena, India, Bermuda and Ceylon. To many Boers used to an unrestricted lifestyle on their farms, this was a traumatic experience that had been captured in a statue named Di Banalum, meaning the exile. Here, a windswept grandfather and his grandson can be seen on the deck of a ship as they are being shipped off to an overseas prisoner of war camp. It is ironic that conditions in these overseas camps were much better than those that the wives, children and elderly parents of the prisoners of war had to endure in local camps. Boredom was a considerable challenge and many prisoners of war engaged themselves in handcraft to pass the time. Many examples of their handiwork are being exhibited in the museum. Later in the war, many elderly men and young boys joined the Boer forces. When captured, many of them were also sent to overseas camps. The same fate struck a number of Achtereers. Here, General Cronier and his wife can be seen with Achtereers in the camp on St. Helena. On the home front, about 12,000 members of the Boer forces continued stubbornly in their fight against the British Army. A statue named Die Bitter Ender, meaning a burger who fought to the bitter end, embodies the hideous circumstances during this period of the war. Despite their courageous efforts, the writing was on the wall for the Boer forces. Shortages in food, clothing, horses and weaponry were widespread. The number of Boer combatants killed in the hostilities grew by the day. It is estimated that approximately 5,500 burghers lost their lives during the course of the war. In 2012, the War Museum constructed a wall of remembrance to honour the fallen Boer. The wall contains the documented names of 4,350 burghers that paid the highest price. On the other hand, about 22,000 British soldiers lost their lives in the war, mainly due to disease. To honour the British fallen, a symbolic cemetery was laid out in 2015 in collaboration with the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. The memorials and crosses in this symbolic cemetery are authentic and date from the war. A garden of remembrance to commemorate approximately 50,000 white and black South Africans who perished in the camps was established in 2017. The names of 35,000 white and black victims on record are portrayed on the walls of remembrance that form part of the garden. In addition, these walls also display extracts from messages of reconciliation by President Steyn and Emily Hobhouse, respectively, that were presented at the inauguration of the Women's Memorial in 1913. The growing number of fatalities, the almost unbearable circumstances under which the burghers had to fight, and the fate of the women and children drove the Boer forces to the negotiation table. On Saturday, 31 May 1902, a peace accord with Britain was concluded at Melrose House, the headquarters of Kitchener in Pretoria. Kitchener signed the peace treaty with this pen. This terminated one of the most violent and tragic chapters in the history of South Africa. In a time when the historical legacy of the war increasingly dwindles into oblivion, the War Museum of the Boer Republics plays a significant role in conserving this aspect of South Africa's cultural historical heritage. For example, 
the neglected small museum on the grounds of the Paderberg battlefield has recently been relocated to the war museum to ensure the conservation thereof. The museum's extensive collection of documentation, records and publications related to the war is currently being digitalized to make it more accessible to researchers, authors and other interested parties. The War Museum also holds a collection of about 10,000 photographs, which is of great culture historical value. Almost all these photographical prints have been digitalized to ensure their preservation and make this collection more readily accessible. In conclusion, the Anglo-Boer War from 1899 to 1902 played a decisive role in the economic, social and political development of South Africa. The collections of the War Museum of the Boer Republics provide in a unique manner insight into the prelude, proceedings and consequences of the war. It is imperative to visit this museum to form a better understanding of the history of South Africa.